a strategic partnership or a plot to undermine U.S. democracy. President Trump's pivot toward Russia is deepening the divide between America and its NATO partners. Across the political spectrum, Washington officials react with outrage over the meeting in Helsinki. As the investigation into alleged Russian meddling in the U.S. election targets 12 Russian intelligence officers and an alleged Russian agent. Will the U.S. president's most ardent supporters remain loyal as the indictments multiply? It's a witch hunt, just like the president said. Also, Trump's senior campaign foreign policy advisor speaks out about his ties to Moscow. Nothing I ever saw or nothing I ever did was even close to being either illegal or even unethical. Hello, I'm Rita Fakhri. Welcome to the program. President Trump's embrace of Vladimir Putin has roiled Washington and shaken the U.S. transatlantic partnership. Over the next hour, we explore the payoffs and pitfalls of the Russian connection. Hello from Washington. His decision to meet with Vladimir Putin, siding with the Russian president against his own intelligence agencies, has placed President Trump once again in the eye of the storm. Democrats and Republicans alike have criticized their commander-in-chief for creating what they call a national security crisis. But first, here's a look at how Trump's foreign policy is raising concerns over America's commitment to the transatlantic alliance. Dear America, appreciate your allies. After all, you don't have that many. Germany, as far as I'm concerned, is captive to Russia because it's getting so much of its energy from Russia. Und dass wir deshalb auch sagen können, dass wir unsere eigenständige Politik machen können. I'm here to continue the proud tradition of bold American diplomacy, diplomacy and engagement is preferable to conflict and hostility. Однако эти трудности, сложившиеся напряженные атмосферы, не имеют объективных причин. Холодная война давно закончилась. Facing a complex and uncertain security environment, we must work together to keep our nations and our citizens safe. We have a very good relationship. Because of me, they've raised about uh, $40 billion over the last year. So I think the Secretary General likes Trump. He may be the only one, but that's okay with me. So how then are America's allies grappling with a president who has a drastically different view of America's role in the world? Let's discuss with our guest Charles Kupchan, who is President Barack Obama's Senior Director for European Affairs at the National Security Council. He also served in a senior White House role under President Bill Clinton. And Matthew Koenig served in senior roles in the Department of Defense and Central Intelligence Agency. He was also a foreign policy advisor to Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney. And of course, both of you are Georgetown professors. Let me start with you, Charles Kupchan. First, we saw the arm twisting, the bullying at NATO, what Trump would call his brand of bold diplomacy. Then we saw the very soft diplomacy, shall we say, with uh, Vladimir Putin. Russia is a competitor. The EU is now a foe. Why was Trump going so out of his way, not just to meet with Putin, but to accommodate him, even defend him at, at a time like this? We still don't know why President Trump shows such affection for Mr. Putin. From the very beginning of the campaign, right through his visit to Helsinki, he shows favor towards almost no one other than Vladimir Putin. Some people say, well, Putin has the goods on him. There is collusion. There's financial wrongdoing. Who knows? But the bottom line is that he went to NATO and he set everybody's teeth on edge by hectoring them about defense spending. It's fine to, to, to complain about defense spending, but one should treat allies respectfully and one should not undermine trust and the habits of cooperation that are the lifeblood of NATO. And then he goes to Helsinki and he makes nice to a president who was interfered in the affairs of the United States, who's invaded Georgia, who's invaded Ukraine, who is supporting Assad, who gasses his own people. And one just comes away from this week thinking, 
what is this president up to? Well, a lot of people are asking the question, certainly here in Washington, and a lot of words like appeasement, betrayal, national emergency, national security uh, crisis have been used. Do you see the situation in those terms? And do you think Trump is able to survive this backlash? I think that, that Trump will survive this backlash because he is supported by a Republican House and a Republican Senate. I don't see this week as a game changer. But the elections it, are coming up. But the elections are coming up. And, you know, and as someone who is not a big fan of President Trump, the best hope for this country is November. Because if the Democrats can carry the Senate or the House or both, finally we will have a check on a president who is really running a, a very dangerous foreign policy. You say you're not a big fan. William Kerning, I know you are a little more sympathetic to President Trump, saying we should focus on the big picture. Doesn't it harm him, though, politically, domestically, and obviously with his allies abroad, to be cozying up with Vladimir Putin at a time when you've got all these indictments in the Russia investigation uh, against uh, Russian intelligence officials? I think it depends on what you mean by cozying up. Uh, y yes, there was the meeting this week, but if you look at what's happened over the past 18 months, the Trump administration has actually been pretty good to Europe and pretty tough on Russia. Uh, so they've increased dis defense spending for the European Defense Initiative. Uh, they've uh, promised to strengthen nuclear and missile defense policy, something that Putin doesn't like very much. They've struck uh, Putin's ally Assad in Syria, struck Russian forces uh, in Syria. Um, so that they've been pretty tough on Russia. Well, well, that, that might be the administration, though. But when it comes to Putin himself, the body language, the optics say a completely different story, don't they? A lot of people say that he may be playing Putin's game, isn't he? Well, uh, again, I think we need to distinguish between what, what's actually happening on the ground and, and what's happened uh, in the past uh, day or so. And uh, the statements yesterday were puzzling. Uh, I formerly worked in the intelligence community. It's very difficult to get uh, consensus uh, on anything in the intelligence community. So when they're coming forward this strongly saying that Russia meddled in the election, uh, I don't have any doubt uh, that Russia meddled. Uh, so I, I stand by the intelligence community assessment on that, and I think most of the Republican Party does as well. Well, those who say Russia meddled, uh, Charles Kription, uh, in fairness to Trump, and those people who've been defending him on, on this, will say that the U.S. also has a long history of meddling in elections around the world, uh, not to say uh, fermenting uh, chaos sometimes, imposing its, the kind of leaders it wants to see in power in some regions. So beyond that, what is so problematic with President Trump wanting to engage with, as he say Russia, which is the world's other major nuclear power. I'm all for a good relationship between the United States and Russia. The world would be a safer place if Moscow and Washington were getting along. But I also believe that the way to deal with Russia is through strength. Mr. Putin is nothing if not a wily former KGB agent. And he understands power. He understands asymmetries of power. It's no accident that he has picked fights with the United States in areas where he enjoys a natural advantage, Syria, Ukraine, Georgia, the strategic gray zones. But I do think that if Trump is going to have a better relationship with Russia, he needs to stand his ground. And he also, he needs to bring the United States along with him. And when you have the intelligence community of this country saying, with consensus, they interfered in the election, we just indicted dozens of Russians, the president has to say, I get it, yeah. right? Because otherwise he loses domestic support. And what he's been doing is showing a complete lack of concern for these allegations. At one point, does he say, I get it, this is serious enough? Well, I think a lot of people are conflating whether Russia intervened in the election or not, and uh, whether they, they swung the election, and whether there was co collusion between Trump and the Russians. So there are three different issues there. But we're not talking about collusion just yet. We're talking about these indictments of Russian intelligence uh, officials and a Russian agent uh, that point to the Kremlin's role in this, potentially. Yes. So, so I think there's no real question that, that Russia intervened in the election. That's uh, absolutely the case. I'm convinced of that. Um, but I think many people then jump from that and say, therefore, uh, Trump was complicit in this, and therefore, uh, the Russians helped to swing the election. And there, we don't have uh, evidence. But I suppose my question is, why won't Trump accept this basic fact, though? I'll we'll give not. you my personal theory. And that is that, set, let's set aside for the time being whether they have some goods on him, financial collusion, whatever. Compromising. It's that he is an extraordinarily material. insecure person. He is someone who has never been accepted by the business community or by the political establishment. He doesn't want to do anything that would suggest that he's an illegitimate president. 
That is to say that he was elected because of the interference of a foreign power. That's my view as to why he is basically saying, I side with Putin. He says, we didn't interfere. I believe it. And again, I think to your point, Charles Kupchin, he again alluded to the fact in that extraordinary press conference with Putin that he'd won the election fair and square. Why would he feel the need to go back into history and, and tell us that he'd won the election if he wasn't feeling insecure about it? Well, as I said before, I think many people, maybe in, even including the president, are uh, conflating whether Russia meddled versus the uh, legitimacy of, of the election. And I think they're two separate issues. Uh, going back to uh, cooperation with Russia, um, the desire to cooperate with Russia, I think, is understandable. Uh, Obama tried it. Bush tried it before him. Better relations between the United States and Russia uh, would be a good thing for the world. Uh, we do have some issues we, we need to discuss uh, in the near term. Extending the New START Treaty, I think, would be in both countries' interests. Uh, and so uh, there are some issues where uh, President Trump is going to have to be able to, to meet with Putin, to uh, come to agreements. And I think uh, within Washington, we need to understand that there needs to be some room uh, for, uh, for a dialogue between the United States and Russia. A dialogue that uh, President Trump has said has included Syria. We obviously don't know what happened in that two-hour uh, closed-door meeting, but we know that they discussed Syria. Is there any doubt in your mind, uh, Charles Caption, as you look at what might have emerged on this, that uh, Trump may have acceded to Putin's demands to essentially give him a, a blank slate uh, to deal with Syria the way he wants? Well, you know, the, co the cold, harsh reality is that uh, the fight in Syria is coming to an end because the Syrian regime, backed by Iran, Russia, Hezbollah, and other actors, is winning. And that leads to a situation in which we might get to a political settlement because the parties on the ground know where they stand. So I actually don't think the U.S. has much option but to kind of work with Russia to create a political settlement, try to contain Iranian influence. But it does seem like the meeting that took place in Helsinki was kind of devoid of substance. We didn't see any progress of substance on Syria. On Ukraine, they were largely silent. On arms control, maybe they discussed something. But in general, it seems the president went over there, gave the store away on the intelligence issue, and didn't make any progress on the underlying issues that I think Matt and I agree need to be resolved. Matt Kroeding, there is a pattern emerging, though, isn't it? This isn't just an American president acting like a loose cannon, shooting from the hip, attacking NATO members and the EU. There is a bit of a strategy, isn't there? Well, I think the uh, Trump administration uh, does have a, a strategy, and I think it's actually more consistent with the way past presidents have done things than many people recognize. But so what is it beyond being a disruptive strategy? What is it? Well, if you look at the national security strategy uh, published earlier this year, uh, very consistent with, I think, the way the United States has thought about its role in the world. We have these threats from Russia, China, rogue states, terrorists. Um, we've recognized great power competition as, as the greatest threat to the country. Uh, and so um, I, th I think there is a worldview within the Trump administration. And um, you know, I think the administration is trying to harness some of Trump's unusual characteristics for the better. And I think the uh, fact that he's willing to open up some closed issues uh, has been helpful in certain areas. Uh, with the North Korea negotiations, we've got a long way to go. But I think we've made some progress. I think it's hard to imagine we would have gotten here uh, with with another president. So yes, some unusual elements, but some consistency. Some consistency as well. Charles Kupchin, when you worked uh, with President Obama, you did fault him at some point for not being bold enough, for not escalating when he needed to. This president is now being criticized for being a little too bold. Uh, could he be onto something? Could it be a constructive way of approaching uh, the different uh, foreign policy challenges in the world? Well, you know, I think in terms of, of what Matt just said, yes, he's trying to, to go back to a more meat and potatoes foreign policy of focusing on China and Russia and great powers. But what I find most troubling is that he is threatening the core, that there has been since World War II an Atlantic community among whom war is unthinkable, right? Borders are gone. And what we are seeing day by day is the erosion of that order. He calls Europe a foe. He sees the European Union is out to get the United States. He looks at NATO and sees this is a bad deal. So what most worries me is that we're going to wake up in the morning and we're going to be back in the 19th century and all the hard work that Americans, Europeans, and others have done since World War II will be 
poof. But gone. he campaigned, didn't he, on many of these disruptive uh, approaches. So is he essentially just fulfilling his mandate and the pledges he made to the electorate by disrupting, by trying to tear down all of these uh, post-World War II institutions, or is he doing the bidding of Putin, as some of his critics are suggesting? I think that there's a lot more to Trump than, than we originally thought. I think he's actually quite ideological. I think he has a view of the West that is white, that is Christian. He wants to go back to the 19th century. And as he said in his UN speech, he wants a world of sovereign, hard powers, nation states acting in their self-interest. If we can on occasion cooperate with others, great, but the world and the United States are now on their own. Let me just finally ask uh, Matt Kroening, if I can. The United States now on their own. In this country, the Senate voted 97 against two to support NATO ahead of uh, Trump's visit uh, to Europe. Clearly, his electorate also believes, 70 percent of them, I believe, in the latest survey, feel very strongly toward NATO, thinking that it is an essential uh, element for U.S. Uh, security. Why then is he going against the grain? Well, I think this is an issue that Charlie and I uh, largely agree on, that the post-Cold uh, World War II order that the United States has built has made the world a much more stable, prosperous, free place than it's been any time in human history, and that this uh, will continue to, to benefit the United States. I don't think Trump wants to get rid of NATO. Uh, I think he just has a different approach for uh, encouraging NATO countries to spend more, uh, and so we'll have to see how that works. We will see how it all plays out. Charles Kupchin, Matt Kroening, for now, thank you both very much indeed. The U.S. relationship with Russia has gone through several phases in the last decade. In 2009, the Obama administration attempted to reset relations between the two countries after tensions ran high under President George W. Bush. Now President Trump faces mounting domestic and international opposition as he aims to redefine America's relationship with Moscow. Teva Abdullah has our five facts. The U.S. Congress imposed sweeping new sanctions on Russia in 2017 and made it harder for Trump or any future president to lift them. The law targets 700 Russian individuals and companies, among them key Putin allies. It was a response to the alleged Russian meddling in the 2016 presidential elections. They also passed a resolution on the eve of Trump's European trip, honoring NATO while condemning Russian aggression. Members of NATO took countermeasures against Russia, including economic sanctions. Established in 1949 as a collective defense against the Soviet Union, Article 5 of the treaty states that any attack on a NATO member is an attack on all of them. It's been invoked only once in its history, in response to the 9-11 attacks. Russia sees NATO's expansion as a threat. They say a deal made in 1990 negotiations over German reunification, NATO promised not to expand into Eastern Europe. NATO has officially denied this, calling it a myth. Since then, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, the Baltic states, and others were granted membership. NATO partnered with Russia and established a Council of Cooperation in 2002 to ease tensions and collaborate on mutual security interests. But the alliance suspended the Russia-NATO Council in 2014 in response to the Ukraine crisis. President Trump has called on NATO members to increase military spending for joint defense. Countries committed to at least 2% of their GDP, but only five of the 28 countries meet the target, the US, Greece, Poland, Estonia, and the UK. Member states below the mark, including Germany and France, say they aim to reach 2% by 2024. Now Trump has called on NATO members to double their commitment to 4%, more than the U.S. currently spends on defense, which is around 3.5% of its GDP. I have great confidence in my intelligence people, but uh, I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. Everybody's been affecting everybody's elections for hundreds of years. Welcome back. Recent U.S. polls indicate Americans are split 
along party lines over the ongoing investigation into possible collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia in the 2016 presidential election. Here's a look at some of the key developments so far in the Mueller investigation. Since May 2017, former FBI Director Robert Mueller has led a special counsel investigation into allegations of Russian interference in the U.S. election, including possible collusion between the Trump campaign and Moscow. The investigation includes potential obstruction of justice by President Trump. In October 2017, Donald Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, was indicted on several charges including tax and bank fraud. In December 2017, former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn became a cooperating witness after pleading guilty to making false statements to the FBI. In February 2018, Mueller secured a guilty plea from Rick Gates, a former Trump campaign aide and longtime Manafort business partner. George Papadopoulos, a former Trump campaign foreign policy advisor, also pleaded guilty, as did London-based Dutch attorney Alex van der Zwan. Also, in February 2018, Mueller indicted 13 Russian citizens and three Russian companies, including the Internet Research Agency, on conspiracy charges. In April 2018, after receiving a referral from Special Counsel Mueller and securing a search warrant, the FBI raided the offices of Trump's longtime personal lawyer Michael Cohen, seizing business records, emails and documents related to several topics under investigation, including payment of hush money to Stephanie Clifford, also known as Stormy Daniels. In June 2018, Konstantin Kilimnik, Manafort's Russia-based business partner, was charged with attempting to obstruct justice by tempering with witnesses. Also in June, a judge sent Manafort to jail to await trial. And just last week, the Justice Department announced indictments against 12 Russian nationals, all members of an intelligence agency, accusing them of hacking emails and computer systems belonging to the Democrats. So far, there have been no charges against Trump or his associates specifically related to possible collusion with Russia and no indication if President Trump will be subpoenaed and forced to testify in any of the ongoing investigations. And now the U.S. Department of Justice has charged an alleged Russian agent of attempting to influence Republican politicians in 2016. Now, one of the individuals under FBI surveillance who has testified before Congress about his Russian connections is Carter Page, a former foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign. I sat down with him just before the latest indictments of 12 Russian intelligence officers and the alleged agent were announced. Here's his take on the investigation. Based on all the evidence which keeps coming out step by step, drip by drip, there is a lot of detail showing that it was based on politically motivated individuals within the Democratic National Committee and elements within the intelligence community in the United States, which is pretty unfortunate. Well, you mentioned the Democrats, and the Democrats offered this assessment of you in one of their reports. They say, and I quote, Page is the type of susceptible and ambitious individual with impressionable views broadly aligned with the Russian government's worldview, who would be a prime target of the Russian intelligence services. Could it be that Putin or his associates might have tried to cultivate you as an agent of influence over Trump and the campaign? I have been going to Russia since 1991 in the final months of the Cold War in the Soviet era. And I have never been asked to do anything questionable, immoral, or illegal by any Russian individual. Did so, you ever meet with Vladimir Putin? Never. But you met with the Deputy Prime Minister of Russia? I said hello to him in the summer of 2016, which is what the Democrats love to uh, focus in on, which it, is It's ridiculous. interesting because you also met the very influential uh, Russian ambassador to the United States as well. Initially, you weren't all that forthcoming, were you, about those contacts. How would you describe your role within the Trump Organization? How senior, how influential, how junior were you? I was a junior volunteer on a, a big committee that they had with uh, focused on foreign policy. You know, it started off with a few people early in uh, 20, uh, 2016 and it continued to grow and I essentially had no influence whatsoever. So you say you were just a junior volunteer. How then would you explain the fact that people as influential within the Russian government as the deputy prime minister the Russian ambassador to Washington would have had both the time and the interest to meet with someone like you who, as you say, was just a, a junior volunteer. 
I think like most politicians you know, from around the world, they have opportunities to say hello to people, you know, whether it's in a receiving line or something brief like that. And that's exactly what happened in the summer of 2016. But if it was just a hello, then why, why is it that in a letter dated August 25th, 2013, you say that you have had the privilege to serve as an informal advisor to the staff of the Kremlin. These were your words. And then on that trip that you mentioned in 2016, in the summer of, when you were a volunteer to the Trump campaign, you actually said after your trip in an email to the Trump campaign that you had incredible insight and outreach during your trip. Russian legislators and senior members of the presidential administration uh, were people you met with. Why would you brag about those if, if it was just a hello? It's not bragging. You're just saying the fact that there is a lot of interest in new possibilities for relations between the two countries. You were a former foreign policy advisor to Donald Trump. To his campaign. I've never met him. You've never time. met him. You've never communicated with him by email, by phone? Never. You never had contact with him? Zero. How then did you become one of his key foreign policy advisors? And he himself mentioned you by name when he was talking about just a handful, just five foreign policy advisors that he'd hired during the campaign. He never hired me. I was, again, just a volunteer. Sure, but I mean, he mentioned you by name. He only identified by name five people on his campaign as foreign policy advisors. What is it then, do you think, that made him or his team select you? Well, he mentioned at the, if you actually read that quote, he mentioned specifically that there are others, and so it was just a brief sampling. So. No, he did mention others, but I'm, I'm just curious because I know you have a background in the banking sector, in the energy sector, mm -hmm. but from what I can tell, there's no foreign policy experience uh, to be highlighted on your profile. What, well, what, what were the foreign policy credentials that you brought to his campaign? I think one interesting thing about his campaign is that he liked people with practical experience, and the fact that I had actually done billions of dollars of transactions um, in uh, around the world, I think was, you know, possibly something that might be. One of the major transactions, I think it's fair to say that you did, uh, were in Moscow. You lived there for a few years and worked there. Could your links and contacts with Russian officials uh, have helped you land this job as a foreign policy advisor with the Trump campaign? I don't think so. I, you know, I had a lot of experience. You mentioned Russia, and I think there's a general obsession with Russia in the media, but I've, uh, done a lot in the Middle East, uh, throughout Africa, Asia, and here in North America. So it's really worldwide. The main crux of why my name has been in the news is are the abuses of power and the abuses of the U.S. intelligence community in the time leading up to the 2016 election and the basically the year after it. You talk about abuses. Are you suggesting, though, that the American legal system is corrupt? I think there are, like every country, uh, rule of law is something that needs to um, be carefully cultivated. There was definitely a lot of corruption that led up to the abuses that I suffered, um, and that was meant to um, damage the Trump campaign. But I think over time, I have a lot of confidence that these, this damage that was done will be uh, repaired. You, you've called this investigation a disgrace and a witch hunt. Why would the FBI, though, have spent so many resources, so much time, on an investigation that had nothing to it? Regarding the first half of their, uh, their focus, there were a lot of abuses and a lot of people that had political motivations. And I think now that they're moving into the second phase of their investigation, looking into the uh, alleged abuses against the Trump campaign, I think there's going to be a lot more about that. And again, I think it's all in answer to question, very politically motivated. Well, you say it's politically motivated, but how can you say that? How can you call it a witch hunt when 20 people, many of them very close to President Trump and to the Trump campaign back then, have been either indicted or have given guilty pleas? I think you're uh, mixing some facts. There are no, but these a are lot the of facts. The, the majority of those people on the Russian side had no relationship with him at all. But there's a few uh, very senior people around Trump who had clearly a relationship with him. You had two ex-Trump advisors who lied to the FBI about their contacts with Russians. One of them was the national security advisor. I can only speak for myself what I've done and my interactions with uh, the Trump campaign. And nothing I ever saw or nothing I ever did was even close to being either illegal or even unethical. Mm -hmm. 
all the people I dealt with in the Trump campaign in uh, 2016 until I was forced out by this fake witch hunt in uh, September of 2016. All those people were top, really great uh, individuals with a lot of integrity. So. Some, though, in the United States have gone as far as to suggest that Donald Trump may have been either an unwitting or witting agent for the Russians. You laugh. Any reason why some people believe firmly that this may have been the case? It's political motivation to tear the poor individual down. It's absolutely ridiculous. But what makes you so sure that Donald Trump may not have had that sort of relationship, that close relationship uh, that may have led to some kind of collusion with the Russians? I've never seen any collusion whatsoever with Russia. I've seen a lot of collusion between the Democrats and the U.S. intelligence community, but I think that's being fixed right now. What do you say to those Americans who consider that Trump is actually doing the bidding of Vladimir Putin, whether he knows it or not, and that he, his actions are contributing to undermining democracy and the authority of the United States and the world? I think it couldn't be further from the truth, and it's literally the polar opposite of exactly what he's doing. This is not a plot to divide Americans and undermine U.S. democracy? There was definitely some plots to um, undermine U.S. democracy based on the abuses that I suffered. Um, when I was part of the Trump campaign, in but which not, they not, in not a Russian suffered. plot. I've never seen anything. I've never seen any real evidence that would support that thesis. While President Trump continues to forge a close relationship with Putin, many here in the United States question his motives. But his supporters see the Russia probe and criticism of the president as yet another example of political bias. We visited the town of Dundalk in Baltimore, Maryland, to gauge the mood among Trump's base. Russia is another sovereign nation. If we don't have a good relationship with other sovereign nations, how can we possibly be a sovereign nation ourselves? I don't have no problems with his openness with Russia. We have no problems with Russia at the moment whatsoever. They're also a superpower, right? We don't want to trouble anybody. Everybody's been affecting everybody's elections for hundreds of years. It only became a problem when Donald Trump won the presidency. That's when it became a problem. You never heard about it when Bush won, or Obama, or no. You only heard about it when the best president of the United States won. I don't think they've meddled in our elections any more than we've meddled in theirs. Our problems have been more the Democrats meddling with everything, paying money to get around the laws itself. And Robert Mueller's not doing too good. Public in my eyes, huh? I think what's going to come out of the investigation is nothing. President Trump's going to not do nothing because he didn't do nothing. <laughs> I mean, in, in my honest opinion, it, it's been a, a, a total waste of taxpayers' money. It's a hate fest. I think Miller should be taken out of the position. For over, what, two, almost two years now, they've been trying to find evidence and have not found any firm evidence proving the fact that they did. It's all allegations still this point. It's a witch hunt, just like the president said. They're members of the FBI that should lose their jobs over all of this. This is ridiculous. They, they better come out with really good evidence, and I don't think they will. And if they do, I believe it'll be rigged. Larry Johnson is a former analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency who also served in the State Department's counterterrorism office. He joins me now. Larry Johnson, you do not believe that the Russians were behind any of the hacking or meddling in the U.S. election? If not the Russians, who then? I, I think it was likely uh, something like the Ukrainian the government. The Ukrainians? Yes. What motive would the Ukrainians have had? Uh, the motives for the Ukrainians are to portray the Russians as the ultimate enemy of the United States, to solidify the support of the United States for the Ukrainian movement that wanted to join with NATO. And if you recall, the Maidan in 2014 was really the impetus for well, the referendum that took place in Crimea and then the subsequent war uh, civil war in Ukraine uh, that pitted the eastern and western Ukrainians against each other. Sure, but this doesn't seem to make much sense. Why would the Ukrainians want to see Trump elected as president no, no, of, the, of the U.S., knowing that he is uh, Vladimir Putin's they, preferred they, candidate? They, they didn't want to see him elected as president. They wanted to damage him, tar him with the, the label of being a Russian stooge, a pu Putin puppet, so to speak. And I think they've largely succeeded in that operation so far because it's become a common theme that Russian, quote, meddled in our election. 
the reality of the history of the U.S. and Russia with respect to efforts to influence each other's elections goes back 90 years. What happened in 2016 not only was nothing new, but the, the intent, the, the, the presentation of it to the American public as if this was an act of war by some elements is just ridiculous. But what are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that the indictments that we saw recently uh, targeting 12 Russian military intelligence officers are part of a wider conspiracy? I don't know if I call it a conspiracy, but I would call it a fraud. That and those indictments are a fraud. There are several things in the it. The fraud perpetrated by whom? Are you saying that the U.S. intelligence agencies were in on this? I think yes. No, I know for a fact senior leaders at both the Central Intelligence Agency and at the Director of National Intelligence were involved with directly trying to thwart Donald Trump from taking office prior to the election and after the election and were collaborating with elements of the FBI. How, how then do you explain the conclusion that was reached by so many of the U.S. intelligence agencies, the House Intelligence Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, on top of all these okay. indictments, which are pretty serious? Okay, they? can you tell me? How do you explain those? I can very, let's start very simply. What is the document that, it, that says that the U.S. intelligence community agrees? Do you know what that document is? Well, the, the U.S. intelligence agree. I mean, no, Dan no, Coates no, said, no, no. said as much, and the he docu- leads all 17 no, 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 intelligence no, 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 agencies. No, that's, that's not correct. What is correct? Well, that is what he said on the record. Dan Coates, know, who leads the intelligence but agencies, then, but then he, has said unequivocally, but Larry Johnson, changed, he has said that he believes it, the Russians he, were behind but, Oh, he believes that the, the Russians meddling. were behind it. But we're not talking religious faith here and belief. We're talking intelligence, which is knowledge. Well, clearly and if he's you don't, basing it on no, intelligence. No, no, You're a former CIA no, I'm officer. telling you, I, having read the so-called assessment, the only document that exists is the one that was issued in January 2017. Only three of the 17 intelligence agencies coordinated on that. The CIA, the FBI, and NSA was included, but NSA was sort of wishy-washy in endorsing the, the, the conclusions. If you look at that document, there is not a single piece of evidence in the document where they say, according to this source, according to that source, it's all we assess. Well, we haven't seen all the evidence they have, no, no, no. obviously, but what we know in the latest that, indictments no, is that this is a very, it's a very, very detailed listen indictment to, listen with to me about, very specific names no, I know of that. people belonging and working for the GRU. Listen to me Russian about how these agency. documents are drafted. Uh, I used to write them. If you have an actual source document, like a piece of signal energy, an intercepted communication between two parties, or if you have a human intelligence report, you will say, according to sensitive intelligence, according to a knowledgeable source. You don't have a single reference to a single source in that entire document that was issued. Number two, if you go to the indictment, the indictment purports to pretend that they're presenting uh, forensic analysis of the DNC servers and computers. FBI never got access to those computers. So how does the FBI claim to have knowledge about something that they didn't even examine? But, but how do you have knowledge about it being Ukraine uh, behind this? Because, how, would you, how would you make such a Because such when, you look, a when you look at the Guccifer 2.0 documents that were released 500 days ago, in the metadata that's contained in those, uh, those documents, the, all the indicators point to Russia. Uh, Felix uh, Edmundovich Derzhinsky, who was the first head of the secret police in, in, in uh, Soviet uh, under the Stalin, under Lenin. And as you go through that, you realize a professional cyber intelligence officer does not put data and information in the headings of their documents that would point back to the country that did it. These things were so obvious and so blatant so transparent that it was Russia. You couldn't read it without knowing it was Russian. And, and that, that right there is a tell. Because I've been involved with covert operations on the American side. We make sure the people with, that what we're doing is not known by the other side and it's not attributable to us. It's always attributable to a third party. But whoever was behind this, clearly, it constitutes, doesn't it? But a major national security what? But behind what? breach. But would you no, say no, what? Be behind the meddling and the hacking? No, no, wait. I let's, mean, clearly let's, some hacking. Let's define, let's no. define what well, actually two things happened. Define what took place. Hacking there was, of the Democrats. There was uh, DNC emails, emails that were taken. There was exactly. emails taken from John Podesta. There were emails taken from Hillary Clinton. We know t- for today from testimony just the other day that those 30,000 emails went to China. They didn't go to Russia. They went to China. Louis Gormard got that out of Peter Strzok the other day at the, t- at, at the hearing. So what, what we're finding is it's not just one incident, 
And apart from that, there was no evidence of, quote, Russia doing it. Okay. And let me, just one final point. The United States intelligence agencies claimed there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. We trusted them. How did that turn out? It was a lie. And I'm telling you that right now, with this, they're lying again. It's not the first time. Larry Johnson, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, the backlash certainly continues. President Trump's return to Washington was met with outrage from members of both parties. In response to the harsh criticism, this is what he had to say. I've said this many times. I accept our intelligence community's conclusion that Russia's meddling in the 2016 election took place. Could be other people also. Uh, there's a lot of people out there. Uh, there was no collusion at all. It should have been obvious. I thought it would be obvious, but I would like to clarify, just in case it wasn't. In a key sentence in my remarks, I said the word would instead of wouldn't. The sentence should have been, I don't see any reason why I wouldn't or why it wouldn't be Russia. Joining me now is Malcolm Nance, a U.S. terrorism expert and former naval intelligence officer. He is out with a new book, The Plot to Destroy Democracy, How Putin and His Spies Are Undermining America and Dismantling the West. Malcolm Nance, under pressure, clearly, President Trump has now backtracked and seemingly is backing his intelligence agencies over the Russia allegations. You know, we could have predicted that that's what Donald Trump would do. Whenever he's caught in a hard space, particularly when he does something that's very egregious, uh, he tends to go back, pretend like videotape doesn't exist, come and say that he never said that or he intended to say something else. But you notice at the end of his statement, he hedged again. Well, exactly, because he, he seems to be saying that now he actually uh, b uh, believes in the conclusion of his intelligence agencies, right. except to go back and drop hints that it may also be someone else. Yeah, which means that you don't believe in the conclusions of your intelligence agencies. You know, this is par for the course for President Trump, and he's very difficult character to, uh, to really pin down on what's the truth and what is not the truth. I think that the most dangerous aspect of this is perhaps he's not sure of what the truth is in his own head. Perhaps he doesn't, you know, see things with the reality that we see it. And it's the only thing that could explain it. And I try to make sense of that in my book, that, you know, Donald Trump works for Donald Trump. But the Russians don't play that game. The Russians have a strategy, and they are exploiting us with it. And where does Trump fit within that strategy? Well, I think Donald Trump, over time, has transitioned from being what the, the Soviets would have called in the old days, a spy parlance, a useful idiot. That's a person who is doing things but doesn't really understand that he's benefiting another country or another agency. But I think very early on in 2012 and 2013, he transitioned to what I would call an unwitting asset. And that's a person who is now working in the interest of a nation. Uh, he's doing things which he thinks is benefiting himself, but are in fact benefiting another country. And he's actually interacting with that country. So for example, selling real estate to Russians and knowing a lot of that money is illicit money. That's being an unwitting asset. They're using you. And they know that, you, and you know that, that you're gaining something from them, but you don't see the, the, you know, the strings on the marionette's puppet, so to speak. Did, did you get to the point where you believe he actually turned into a witting asset, knowing that the Russians were, as Putin himself admitted, favoring his election and doing what they can to help him? Yes, and I do believe that he's a witting asset now. And his behavior in Helsinki, uh, the other day led everyone to believe just what exactly does Moscow have on this guy to the point where he almost seemed like he was a junior partner or the vice president of Russia and not the, you know, the president of the United States. Um, I think he became an unwitting asset. Uh, initially, I had thought it was when he said, Russia, are you listening, in uh, August 2016. But now that I've written and done research on it, it appears that it came much earlier than that. And that's July 2013, I'm sorry, November 2013. Sure, I mean, uh, Putin had his reasons as to why he would like to see a President Trump instead of a, a President Hillary Clinton, clearly. He knew that Trump sure. was interested in, in fixing the relationship between the two countries. Uh, but beyond that, is there anything that discounts the possibility, as a former CIA analyst who we've spoken with uh, put forward, the possibility that it may be another country that's behind the hacking and the meddling, uh, Ukraine or, or another country? I mean. Well, the, Ukraine, the idea of it being Ukraine is absolutely ludicrous, okay? Because one thing, the evidence that we have right now that we've put out in public is overwhelming. 
uh, the indictment against the Russian military intelligence agency, the GRU. We have the capability to determine where a person is. And in, throughout some news media stories that came out this year, we saw that Allied intelligence, NATO intelligence, had gotten right to the point where we were using their own video cameras to watch them log into their offices and carry out all of these nefarious activities. So there is no doubt whatsoever, 100 percent, by the entirety of U.S. intelligence, NATO intelligence, that it is Russia who carried out this act, and they did it to benefit Donald Trump. How difficult, though, would it have been of the FBI to retrace it all the way back to these 12 military intelligence oh, officers? Phenomenally difficult. You have to understand something. That is not the FBI doing that work. That's the CIA finding out their real names, finding out where they live, what unit they belong to, who their commanding officer was in the chain of command. The National Security Agency and our sister intelligence collectors doing signals intelligence, you know, uh, doing cyber warfare, and actually watching them stroke the keys and finding what their logins were on their computers. It was a masterful piece of counterintelligence, and we were showing them we have the capability of knowing precisely who you are and what you're doing. And, and I suppose you wouldn't expect uh, Mueller to come out with these indictments, except if he had very solid evidence. Absolutely, and these indictments were rock solid. And what you can expect next, now that we've gotten the Internet Research Agency, the propaganda arm, and the social media disseminator, the GRU, the actual hackers and crackers who went in there and stole data, the next level will be Russian diplomats and possibly government officials for ordering these attacks. We can indict them also. What is the logical next step, though, the practical step that can be taken? Well, the practical step is in the Mueller team, and they're not going to tell anybody what that is. But they have, you have to understand, they have multiple investigators running down every lead. And like I said, the next step, of course, would be find out who gave these orders. Who in the foreign ministry? Was it Lavrov? Was it uh, someone like, you know, um, in, you know, Igor Sechin, someone in his immediate general, in his immediate council, Prigozhin, who was running the Internet Research Agency. He's already been indicted. That guy started as Putin's chef, and it turns out he's his dirty tricks manager. These people can now be indicted, and it may go as high as the Russian president himself. But is there any way that uh, Putin may not have been in the know? About There's all of impossible. This? It's absolutely impossible. This man is an ex KGB officer. He's the first director of post Soviet intelligence in Russia. He brought under control the mafia using the KGB. He is an autocrat. There is nothing that goes on with his state assets that he doesn't know because, like all good spy masters, he keeps his fingers on what's going on inside as well as out. Might you be giving him a little too much credit, though, and Not influence? Because there's a line in your, in your book, in the opening chapter, in which you say, on November 8, 2016, Vladimir Putin became the first Russian president of the United States. Seriously, <laughs> well, that's how much influence you think he had It sounds over rhetorical, but I think he had an enormous... I think he chose Donald Trump as president of the United States. And I'm sure when this all comes down, people always say, there's no evidence that the votes were impacted. The votes were not impacted at the ballot. The votes were not hacked by Russian intelligence. The mindset of the American public was hacked. And we found that they carried out a very deep, focused influence campaign, which actually found the emotional triggers of the American public and used propaganda from themselves and other groups on Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms to pull those triggers to harness hatred of the other in the United States. And that translated into votes for Donald Trump. All right. Malcolm Nance, thank you very much indeed for your insights. It's my pleasure. Now, while Americans are sharply divided over the Trump-Putin relationship and ongoing allegations about the Kremlin's meddling in the U.S. election, Russians see things differently. Here's the view from Moscow. Мое мнение, что в Америке очень э, сильно, э, сильно демократии, и его все-таки выбирал народ. И это же просто даже смешно. Это надо было купить пол Америки или там всех кого так. Это же так не делается. Просто как обычная война внутренняя. Кому-то это все выгодно и все. And on the other hand, people decide everything, the society. Nobody likes when there is an intent, like, in, intensive uh, relationship between the countries. 
and uh, also all the sanctions and everything. I think it's not not good for both countries. I think everyone would lose from that. Он совсем не глупый. Он очень умный человек. Он хороший хозяин. Он хороший бизнесмен. Мы это мы мы об этом слышали. Более того, мы слышали уже, что считается, что Трампу вообще чуть ли не выходец из из Москвы и и и здесь был в КГБ работал вот. Поэтому, но я думаю, что они придумают что угодно. Могут придумать даже так, что Трамп хочет посадить на свое место. Вообще по ситуации в мире можно сказать, что они довольно-таки натянутые, потому что и Америка имеет какие-то планы и в Сирии, и на Ближнем Востоке в общем. И Россия тоже не хочет отставать и не хочет проявлять слабость. То есть она хочет защитить своих граждан на, не только в Российской Федерации, но и вообще по всему миру. До выборов президента была тенденция, что российское население поддерживало Трампа, Дональда. Но мне кажется, я более чем уверен, что никакого вмешательства не было со стороны России в эти выборы. Я бы хотела, бы, чтобы между Россией и Америкой были хорошие взаимоотношения, потому что я считаю, что это очень важно для нас и для них также. Вот. Meanwhile, the backlash here in the U.S. continues after President Trump's meeting with Vladimir Putin. Senior Republican leaders have joined the chorus of critics who question Trump's allegiance to the United States. And while the U.S. continues to recede as the leader of the Western alliance, it is ceding ground to Russia, with Trump continuing to disrupt the decades-old institutions of the global liberal order. The images of these two leaders together have unsettled many here in the U.S. and around the world, sending shockwaves to America's allies. Whether this heralds a new world order remains to be seen. For now, it increasingly looks like a new world disorder, with the American president intent on carrying out his electoral pledges, however disruptive they may be. From Miri Dafahi and all of the team here in Washington, thanks for watching.